We are on pages 16 through 19. We're going to take it up to the uh, second checkup right now. And this is the first piece of Algebra 2. Um, the hardest thing about this section is there's just a lot of terminology. And then they give an example is like, duh, I know what that is. But trying to remember which, what do they call that kind of a statement? And how am I going to use this? Right now it just seems kind of senseless sometimes. But we are going to use it a lot as we move forward. And if you have already done geometry, some of these should look familiar to you. All right. So first of all, the reflexive axiom. Now an axiom is anything that is just known to be true. It's a basic rule in algebra. But uh, they had to come up with a great vocabulary word for it. So we call it an axiom. All right. So the reflexive axiom means anything is equal to itself. So just grab a number out of the air, 57. 57 equals 57, okay? B equals B, anything that's equal to itself. We call that the reflexive axiom, all right? <clears throat> then if we can take two things, A is equal to B, so then I could say if that's true, then B is equal to A. So I've just switched sides, but the two things are still equal, that's symmetric axiom. Okay, um, some math textbooks call that the commutative property, meaning that you can change the order of things. But anyways, let's not introduce any new terminology. Let's get used to the one they have here, symmetric. Transitive, <clears throat> I always think that's an interesting way they draw this. We talked about this in the, in the geometry course. But A equals B and B equals C. Therefore, A equals C. <clears throat> and I'm tempted to call this substitution because it looks like we're substituting this in place here. But actually, this property has a Z shape. This equals this, and then you start with this one and say and this equals this. And therefore, we can conclude that A equals C. That is called, if you see that Z pattern, it is the transitive property. Okay, transitive property. I thought I had stopped recording, but I see the red light still flashing, so I think this is good. Then um, <clears throat> look at number four, and I want you to first look at the right. It says A equals B. And then notice it says A plus C equals B plus C. And if you think back to algebra, you did this a lot. You said A equals B, so then you said if I add the same thing to both sides, add C to both sides, then the two sides are still equal. So that's the addition axiom of equality. So I've added the same thing <clears throat> to both sides and therefore kept it equal. And then multiplication axiom of equality, similarly if A equals b, now I can multiply a times c, and that will be equal to b times c, a c equals b c. But this is demonstrating that I'm multiplying both sides by the same value of c, and it remains equal if we do that, okay? So let's turn the page and go to page 17. By the way, if your pace test is still in the middle like this one is, pull it out and give it to your mom or your supervisor. Your pace tests should never be left in the middle of your pace. All right, page 17. Wow, here's some, here's some great terminology. Closure axiom for addition. <laughs> if A and B are real numbers, then A plus B equals a unique real number. Wow, all right. But they had to give that a name. Woo Closure axiom. Then the identity axiom means if you add zero to any number, you still have that number. Seven plus zero equals seven. Uh, negative three plus zero still equals negative three. So adding, any, any, adding zero to any number just equals itself. Identity axiom. Additive inverse means if we take any number and we add the negative of that, <coughs> the opposite of it, then you will always get zero for an answer. Okay, so negative 
Well, let's start with positive three, and if I add negative three, I'll get zero. So we, these two numbers are called additive inverse of each other. I could start with a negative number, so negative five plus five equals zero, so we say those are additive inverses. All right, commutative axiom for addition means if A equals B, A plus B, rather, if A plus B, then we can switch the order of the A and the B and say that B plus A equals the same thing. So it doesn't matter the order when we're adding. That's the commutative. I always tell students it's kind of like, you know, your dad commuting for work. So he drives to work and then he comes back again. So he changes location and comes back where he was. Commutative property means we can change the order of the numbers and it does not affect the answer. Now, think about it, that's not true for subtraction, right? So there is no commutative property for subtraction because five minus three is not the same as three minus five. And then the associative axiom for addition. So let me erase a little bit here and show us that if we have a number like two plus three plus four, if I put parentheses around these two, it's going to give me the same answer as if I put parentheses around the three and the four. So this would be five. Solve that first. Five plus four is nine. Here I do what's in the parentheses first. I've associated them together. And that gives me seven. Two plus seven, same answer, nine. So it doesn't matter. I have the same numbers. I'm just associating them differently. And... Uh, it's still equal. So that's why it's called the associative axiom for addition. All right, turn the page. And they give you some things to do there on page 18. And then look at page 19. Axioms for multiplication. Some of these sound similar. So the closure axiom, again, the same idea. If we multiply two real numbers together, then the answer will be a unique real number. The identity axiom, what number can you multiply times any number and you get the value of the original number again? Seven times what equals seven? Okay, negative five times what equals negative five? And the answer is one, right? So the identity axiom for multiplication is any number times one equals itself. Multiplicative inverse, so this was the additive inverse. Multiplicative inverse says if we multiply a number times its reciprocal, so like five over one times one over five, then I'll always get one for the answer. All right, so to give a couple examples of that, and uh, three over seven, the multiplicative inverse is seven over three, because three over seven times seven over three equals one. So in every case, you end up with one, and even if you have negative numbers, you have to multiply by a negative, because you want it to end up being positive one. Okay, it always has to equal positive one for the multiplicative. <clears throat> All right, uh, jumping down to number four, commutative axiom, similar to the commutative axiom for addition. Two times five equals 10, five times two equals 10. Doesn't matter the order when you're multiplying. That's not true for dividing, but it is for multiplying. In addition, associative axiom for multiplication, similar to this, we can change the order that we're multiplying, and just by putting parentheses in, we're still gonna get the same answer. They give an example there with letters. <clears throat> Let's pretend like these are all pluses, I mean times, and let's just illustrate it with numbers, okay? So two times three is six, six times four is 24. Over here, I associate these two together first and I get 12, 12 times two is 24, so we get the same answer. So <clears throat> that's called the associative, <coughs> excuse me, multiplication by zero, anything times zero, right, equals zero. So they have a name for that, multiplication by zero. And then that last one, I just call it distributive property, but wow, they have a little longer name here, don't they? distributive axiom of multiplication with respect to addition. So that sounds intimidating. Let's take a quick look at that. Again, this is probably review if you've been doing Algebra 1. 
let's say I have 2 times 3 plus 4. This means I can multiply the 2 times the first number, 2 times 3, plus, and then multiply the outside times the second number, 2 times 4. So notice this would be 7, wouldn't it? 2 times 7 is 14. Let's look what happens over here. 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 4 is 8. And if you add that, you get 14 as well. So distributive axiom of multiplication with respect to addition. It's distributing that multiplication to both things in the parentheses. All right. So when you get to page 20, they have you writing some of those out and finding some of the answers. And then... I'm going to just go ahead and quick introduce you to, let's go to page um, 22. And no, I'm going to stop there. We'll stop because you have a checkup. I'll come back. Uh, the lesson for page 22, 23 will be short and it'll be building on what we just learned.